This is the Luminate Collective podcast brought to you by AAB Consulting and I'm your host, Shan Parker. Today's guest, Jeff Leesk, is the founding director of Clayhills Consultancy and he specialises in delivering business success through planning, innovation and ambition. Jeff's done it all over the years, from sailing with the Merchant Navy to running pubs with his brother and spearheading the success of Young Enterprise Scotland as their CEO. He shares his experiences, including the challenging moments that shaped him, like navigating the the complex merger of the Prince's Scottish Youth Business Trust with the Prince's Trust and how that period in his life affected his mental health. Jeff's story is full of valuable insights, lessons on the importance of adapting and he shares his favourite saying more than once which is you can do it yourself, a mantra which has been a pattern in one way or another with everything he has done. To hear more, stay tuned. Jeff. Thanks so much for sitting down and having a wee chat with us today. You're probably thinking, what have I signed myself up for with this lot? Turned up and don't really know what to expect, but we'll have a really good chat, I promise. <laughs> I, I've been looking forward to this for, ever since you asked me, however oh, many good. weeks ago. So have you done I, anything like this before? Aye. No. Well, it's small things. Yeah. Uh, small things. Yeah. Uh, but to be honest, the things I've done, I've usually been sat in your shoes. Oh, this will be so, interesting So I, then. I usually, usually I'm the one who's... Uh, Leading or probing so, or asking. At the end questions. of this, I want two bits of feedback. One bit of feedback: How did I do? And the other uh, bit of feedback: What was it like to be in the interviewees? Interviewees chair. Chair. Right. Yeah. I shall See how give we you it off here. <laughs> Thank you. I'll give you it off here. <laughs> so, the way we start these normally is around about your bookmark moment. So I'm going to try and get you to think about a time where you had choices and you could have done one or the other. But whatever you picked ended up getting you to where you are today. Now, it could be anything. It could be like right back at school. It could be in the last 10 years. It could be, I was going to say last week, but that doesn't really, that's not very interesting, is it? So what's what's coming to mind? What could be your bookmark moment that we can talk a bit more about? There's been lots of different yeah. things. And I'm sure everybody yeah. starts the response with that. Say there's lots of things. But I... I I think the thing that was probably my bookmark moment and the one that's uh, continued to have influence on me many, many years on is in 1977. Oh, great. 1977, uh, the, the cost of a, a Daily Star newspaper was five pence, oh. I think, if you ever bought the Daily Star. The Sun might have been five pence. God knows how much a broadsheet was. I only say that because I worked in a paper shop at the That's time, so I can remember <laughs> the prices. But in 1977, there, there was there was something significant happened in the UK, uh, particularly started off in London, and and that was the punk explosion. The punk explosion and uh, the the whether you want to call it rebellion of youth mm-hmm. or. Uh, whether you want to say it was uh, an implosion or an explosion against what young people were seeing around about them, it was that time in 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 the UK that I think things changed. But because of that change, it changed me. Mm. Tell so, me what happened. What happened? What age uh, were you? What were uh, you? Uh, up so to? I, I, I in 1977, I was 14. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was living in a small rural town in the Scottish borders, a little place called Jedburgh. Oh, I actually know that. My auntie and uncle live in Jedburgh. Do they? Yes. Oh, yes. right. Well, well, we'll not announce their names on air. <laughs> I'll tell you their names. I'll tell you after. You tell me after. <laughs> Jedburgh. So you've got an idea of what it's like. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think population circa 4,000. Yep. The borders is it hasn't the Scottish borders as a region has no real main town. It has lots of little towns. Uh, the people in Hoyk and Galashiels yes. might fight it out for who's the biggest, mm-hmm. uh, and they did in many ways. Whether it was in sport or whether at that time it was on a Saturday night in the streets uh, in various ways. So I was brought up in Jedburgh. Uh, and you know, as a young person, you, you either you, you you went along with what was fed to you and what was there for you. Uh, 
I loved football. They didn't play football at school, so I had to play rugby. Which you, so you fell in the system. You played rugby, uh, and you know, not much changed. You, you, some people strove to get away and, and go to university or whatever it might be, and uh, not a lot changed. It just rolled along and rolled along as it was. But that that punk explosion had an impact on me that young people said they could do things differently. Uh, and that you know, if 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 things weren't there for them, they would make them. They would do them themselves. They would create ways of 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 doing that. And I think that from that day, it's made me think in that way that actually you know uh, DIY is 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 the way to do things if you can if you can't if there's nothing there for you then then change it and do something that suits you uh, and if we if we use the punk music as an example uh, you know you think uh, punk bands couldn't get anywhere to play so they would they would Rent their own, rent their own places, find a place. Mm -hmm. Nobody would sign them for record deals, so they'd create their own mm -hmm. records. Uh, nobody would write about them in the mainstream press, so they'd create their own magazines, fanzines. Mm -hmm. They create their own anti-fashion statements, etc. And, and that was just a blissful period. It lasted for quite a short period of time. Okay. In in the true ethos of because. Like all things, people with capital, financial capital, recognise there's something there and therefore they can take that and they can uh, capitalise on that mm -hmm. and make money. And actually, eventually, what was punk as was in 77, 78, uh, became quite mainstream in a way, mainstream record labels, mainstream fashion, mm -hmm. All that sort of stuff, but the bit that you can never take away is what's in there, mm -hmm. in in people's heads, mm -hmm. and I think that impact on people of my age, round about there at that time, has a lasting legacy on on, on many people around my my age mm -hmm. today. So it's interesting. You say you were fourteen. Uh huh. I might butcher this, but you um, might I might butcher this. I right, might get okay. it wrong, Jeff. Right. My uh, colleague, Julie, is right into psychology. She's brilliant. Uh -huh. And there's something about when you are 14, your brain almost sticks in terms of what you know at that time and you'll never forget it. So it's almost like if you think back to your 14 and if you looked in the charts to see what was the top 10 or whatever, mm. you'd be able to recite the word to every song, provided that was your jam and you know yeah. you were into it and all the yeah. rest of it. There's probably an equivalent, whether it's books or uh -huh. films or whatever. But it's really interesting that you say you were 14 at that point because that's there's there's something scientifically that happens within your brain that yeah. sticks. So... No, I've I I I'm no psychologist, no <laughs> expert, but I've actually heard Have you? somebody say that before. Right. Not necessarily with regard to me, yeah, yeah. but with regard to broader mm -hmm. conversations mm -hmm. around about that age mm -hmm. and uh, you know the the recollections that you can have. Yeah. So I, I think there must be something in that. Must be something in must that. Be, uh, uh. Anyway, that's cool. Uh -huh. So you're 14 uh -huh. and you've got all this stuff going on. Uh -huh. Beyond that age, back in those days, what was the done thing? Was it finish school, get a job? Was it finish school, go to uni? Finish school, travel? What was the thing that you know everybody kind of did? The in, traditional in, route? In, in there, yeah. Uh, we had two big. We had one big factory, and then there was another big factory came along. And considering there's four thousand people in the town, you know, one of those factories employed four hundred people, yeah. and the other one went on to employ uh, three or four hundred people. Mm -hmm. And then you had agriculture mm -hmm. uh, and the trades. And, and to be honest, maybe some, I didn't know, I, I never even knew what things like that were local government, you know. Yeah. You, I had no idea what civil service were or mm -hmm. all that. So it was just a weird thing that some people went off to work and they wore different clothes to everybody <laughs> else. But, so that, that, that was pretty much it. And then you were, you were, 
you were corralled at school. There was like a focus of attention on that exit route and what you're going to do. Yeah. And you were... I think that, uh, I think the school had expectations. They, 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 had you, they probably had you marked out from the day you joined to the day you left mm-hmm. and what you were going to do, etc. Uh, but I, I left school in 1980. Uh, I spent between 77 and 80 pretty much doing average at school, mm-hmm. but working a lot. I, I, I had sort of uh, sometimes three jobs, uh, generally two and, and occasionally one, one in the morning, one in the, a- one in the afternoon and one at the weekends. But all I, I had a reason for doing it mm. because I could buy records. Ah, that was your vice. Go to gigs, you okay. see. So, so actually that, that, was, that, that, that was the whole reason mm-hmm. that, that you did all of that. And as I approached my exit, you know, I could have stayed on for six years, but I, God, I couldn't stand it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I applied. You, you'll know lots of airlines. You're a lot younger than me. You could read them all off, like <laughs> Jet Two, Ryanair, EasyJet. The list goes on, mm-hmm. right? But probably about then there was two UK airlines: okay. British Airways and British Caledonian. Ooh. British Caledonian's gone off the top of your head. Yeah. And I thought I could become an airline pilot. Oh. And uh, the the stupidity of youth or the naivety of youth. So I applied and both said, uh-uh. Oh. Uh, so, uh, but then, uh, you know, you have, you, have a, you have another light bulb moment. And, and I don't know, what, what was uh, I put, uh, c- a careers education or careers guidance was like for you? Oh. A wee bit uh, dire, won't it? It was mm-hmm. dire. Yeah. I mean, it was dire. Nineteen eighty. It, 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 it involved a room with lots of uh, folders, yeah. ring back folders, yeah. with magazines in it and magazines and laid out all over the place. And there was just one caught my eye, and it had a it had a ship on it, you know. And I was just, all oh, right. So I can't get in the air. So I get one way to get out of this hellhole. <laughs> is maybe to go to sea. So I, I wrote down all these different addresses and things. Like that. I think I got to take the magazine or the booklet away. And and that was in the day when you then had to write your letters out by hand. Oh, God. And, laborious. Uh, laborious. <laughs> the same letter to, to four, I think I wrote to four companies. Mm-hmm. And uh, write the same letter applying for a, what was an apprenticeship in the Merchant mm-hmm. Navy. And uh, I got two responses. I got one in Southampton offering me an interview and one in London offering me an interview. The Southampton one came first. So that was in the day, well, you know where Jedburgh is. Mm-hmm. I got a lift at the crack of dawn at Newcastle. Mm-hmm. I got a train in Newcastle to London, underground, uh, the other part of London to Southampton, taxi, interview, half an hour. And then the reverse back, do you know <laughs> what you did? Yeah. Uh, and they, they, I got a letter back from them in about three days' time, uh, saying I'd been accepted. Great. Uh, and that was the people that uh, Fife's banana boats. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Fife's. Yeah. So I was over the moon, but uh, I thought I had an interview the following week with this other company in London. I accepted the one in Southampton. Oh. Right. But I still went for the interview. I, I thought, I'm getting paid to go to London. Yeah, we've all done that. There's That's hundreds fine. of record shops in yeah, London. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> hundreds of record shops. I might even get a gig or something yeah, like that yeah. in London. So off I went. I never, I, I had no, no intention, but I think that showed through. I never got accepted. Oh, really? so, was, mm-hmm. uh, okay. so that was me. That was my exit strategy from right. Jedburgh. Right, right. I remember that. That's funny. You say about the careers office. I'm actually struggling to think because I, I I don't know there was ever a careers office as such in in my school. It was very much a a whim of oh, what are you thinking about doing? Oh, I no. want to do this. I want to do that. Um, and I think I've said on here before that I my first thing was I'd like to be a movie star. Clearly that didn't work out. Um, but you know here we are. You're so. behind the camera now. <laughs> Look, you've, you've, you've got where you want. I to. mean, but you're just so naive, and it's almost like how are you supposed to know? I don't think it's possible no. to know. Um, so 
the fact that you saw a magazine with a boat on it and made a decision and went for it and got it, good for you. Oh. Great. Great. And te- talk to me about that first trip, leaving home, <gasps> packing your bag. How superb. long were you away for? I was away for five months that oh, time. Oh, Five God. months. But do you know the best thing about that whole experience was I went down on the uh, the sleeper from Berwick uh-huh. and uh, my mum and dad came to drop me off and wave me away. Oh. I can imagine my mother. Oh, know, yeah, got her tissue. She'd be great, she'd be great, <laughs> she's never showed it yet. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> And and you're live in London, mm-hmm. and that was in the days before you had a mobile phone or anything like the that. Heck? And uh, all I had was this letter because everyone was done by letter, and I had to uh, get to Heathrow to catch us the flight to go to uh, Bremen in Germany, right? Because the ship was going to be in Bremerhaven, right? And I had to somebody would meet you at Bremen. Like right, that's all I had. So you go all the way out to Heathrow, and you go to the check-in desk, and the the the, the woman says behind the desk she says, uh, "There's a message for you here. You have to phone this number in Southampton." Well, I thought that's okay. so. I phoned this number in Southampton. Once you found enough, top two pence for a phone or ten pence. A cheap call was. Two pence. You'll not remember that. I, I do remember, do you remember a two peas. Thanks two very pay, much. Two I'm pay, over thirty. Uh, uh, two peas and ten peas. <laughs> yes. Chucking them in like that, but as fast as you could. Uh, and and I phoned Southampton. They said the ship's been delayed. We've booked you into a hotel in London. Oh. Give me the address, and you have to come back out to Heathrow the following day for the same flight at the same time. Right. I said, excellent. Result. So that's great result. Yeah. So into London, into the hotel, dumped my bags. Straight out, bought a, a, had a copy of the New Musical Express, saw what was on, and the specials were on at Hammersmith <gasps> Pally, 1980. So there I was. I, I, I was a real bonus to, to that joint that ship. There I was at Amazing. Hammersmith Pally, seeing the specials. Fantastic. A wee boy for Jed Bra at Hammersmith Pally. What age one. were you? 17. Yep. 17. Yep. Brilliant. Absolutely. 17 and a half, there you go. Wow. That's cool. And then next day, next back day over off. to Heathrow. Over to Heathrow, yeah. out to Germany. Mm-hmm. I was, do you know, it was, a, it was just like anybody starting a new job, you know. Uh, I was speaking to a young lad yesterday, mm-hmm. 17 or 18, been away to start a new job. And do you know, it's a, it's a hugely daunting experience. Yeah. I mean, jumping way forward and, and uh, uh, we'll maybe talk about when I was at Young Enterprise for 10 years mm-hmm. as chief exec, I used to, it was. It was. It was. Everybody had it in as part of their mantra that when somebody new started, particularly a young person, because we employed, uh, how how you had to treat and look mm. after somebody, because somebody new going into a job, if it's their first job, yeah. whatever way you paint it for them, they're going to. Their expectation is when they go to the next one, it's going to be exactly the same. <laughs> So if you make it awful and bad, and uh, then then you've you've just you've done so much damage. Mm-hmm. So you've you've got to be so careful with that. I don't think they were very careful at uh, Fife's line when I got away. But anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we survived. We survived. Well, you did. It. I mean, how how many years were you there for? How long uh, did you? I did four years with mm-hmm. three and a half, four years with Fife's. Mm-hmm. And then kept getting made. I get made redundant at the end of my apprenticeship. It was, remember, this is the early eighties. That's it. That's the times. Uh, all sorts of stuff, uh, and I ended up getting a job. I worked on chemical tankers for three and a half years. So I did. Right. I think I did about seven years in total in mm-hmm. the Merchant Navy. Mm-hmm. But wonderful experiences. Yeah. Saw some wonderful places. I think I told you before when we spoke that my um, my partner Doug. He is well. He was. In the Merchant Navy, he now works um, in the sort of drilling side of yeah, oil offshore, and gas. He's offshore, offshore now, yeah. but he did sixteen years of college, all the rest of it. Uh-huh. Got to captain, did one trip, and then decided, you know what, I'm going to go and do the drilling instead. Do the drilling instead because um, it's more, you know, um, for less, less responsibility. Uh, uh. Um, so that's it's interesting, and I wonder how the Merchant Navy differs sort of now versus when you did it. It almost sounds like it doesn't really differ that much in terms of, you know, the time away from home, very similar. Um, The sacrifices you have to make, very similar. But 
the life experience and the places you get to see, my God, all over the world, uh, uh, you know? Uh, it, it probably doesn't mm. differ too much. I would say the big difference is probably whereas there might have been 30 of us. Mm. You're probably lucky on some of these That's right. similar sized ships. You'd be down to 14 or That's 15. Right. That's true. People. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, with technology and, uh, mm. and and they're very slick operations now. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, we'd be in port in the early 80s and, you know, dock workers would go home at night or they'd work mm. during the night Jeez. and you'd be off during the day. You know, it's just mm -hmm. everything's. Everything's twenty four seven now, so I, I'd it. imagine it's quite a, it's quite a tough, full on, full on now. Yeah, I'd imagine sort of non stop. But then when you're home, you get the time off, and that's great. Yeah. You know, I don't know what it was like when you did it, but when he did it, it's very much a, you're away for four months. Okay, you're off for four months then to Aye. kind of balance out. Aye. So Aye. interesting. Make you, go, make you go on tour and watch bands oh. everywhere. You, you would have loved that. Eh? I did, yeah. Super fun. Super fun. Fab. That's given us a wee insight into your early years. Yeah. So that's cool. Um, and I didn't know that you were so into your bands. Are you still very much into your music now? Is that still yeah, a, a yeah. hobby and an interest? I was away to see. Th I was out on Friday night to see uh -huh. three bands. In oh Stirling. yeah. Nice. Uh, the Bug Club. Okay. Bikini Body, and uh, Bin Juice. Wow, and they all start well, with a B. Is that on purpose? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, but they were okay. They were okay on Friday night. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's a huge part of my life. That's ace. And I, and I still I do a radio show as well. So. Do you? I yeah. thought you had a voice for radio, I was going to say. A voice for radio, <laughs> not for television. <laughs> but the, 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 uh, I, so I, I, I love doing radio and yeah. playing, playing stuff. It's, do you play any instruments? No, no. No, never really got to that. I was a, I was the singer in the punk band. Right, of course. How could I make that there mistake? <laughs> no, my brother's a guitarist. So, Very good. Uh, and my other brother can play guitar, but I never... Just wanted to be front it. and centre in front of the microphone. There front you go. And front and centre. <laughs> uh. You briefly touched on a moment ago your time at Yes... Young uh -huh. Enterprise, yeah. Scotland. Um, was that straight after? What? Where did we go after the Merchant no, Navy? What so happened? Mer Merchant Navy. It, it was was. You you talk about earlier on about bookmark moments. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it it all goes back to that fourteen year old person that mm -hmm. says, actually, you can do it yourself. You can do it yourself, and. Uh, so I, I was working in the Merchant Navy. I was I was doing shorter trips. I was doing about eight weeks, two months, and six weeks off or something like that. And and you know you'd go home and then you'd be told you'd been made redundant. Uh, but then they'd say you can have your job back on the same ship, but it's now registered in the Philippines, and you're going to get paid in US dollars from Hong Kong or something like that. You know. So you and and then you, it, it went on and on and on. Until, until eventually I said, this is, this is no, this is no, uh, yeah. no future in this. And I, so I just jacked, you know, I just, I, I honestly just, I, I came up to Glasgow here mm -hmm. from the borders and we had a thing called the shipping office in Glasgow at the Broomy Law, pretty much down where uh, all these fancy offices are for okay. the Scottish government. And that oh, yeah, that. yeah. So, mm -hmm. and, and, and I remember walking in and saying, I'm just jacked. He says, he says, I remember the boy saying, I, I didn't, I don't blame you, son. Right. Yeah. And so I had no idea what I was going to do, no idea whatsoever. But I'd always wanted to do things for myself. Always wanted, and so I wanted to have my own business, but I, I, I knew I wanted to do it in some sort of hospitality thing. So I, I, I got, I worked in, I worked in a nightclub in Gala Shields. I worked in a country house hotel. Uh, and I worked in a hotel in Edinburgh, and I worked in a bar in Edinburgh, just learning, yeah. learning the ropes. Until eventually, uh, I saw a property for sale in Hoyk that was run down. It was a bar, and I got enough money together with my brother because I managed to make a few quid in the Merchant Navy, and we got enough from the brewery, some for the bank, and we bought this. Pub, I was age, I was aged twenty six. He was aged twenty two. Nice. Twenty two. 
It was a pub that had really crap reputation, fighting. Uh, hence the reason it was cheap. <laughs> <laughs> had everything going wrong with it. <laughs> and then we had to persuade the licensing board and others to uh, enable us to have a license for this property, which we did. Uh, and off we set, and, and, and we, we we opened the number 10 bar in Hoyk. And we put, what, guess what we put on? Did we put on oh, live bands? Go. Live bands. Of course. And yeah. we did it all ourselves. So everything nice. was DIY, you mm -hmm. know, just, just, we did, if you didn't, if you, if we didn't know how to do something, mm -hmm. we made it up and made it up, made it up until you, you learned. And my God, we had some awful times. Ooh. Really, it was really tough, you know, yeah. really tough. But it makes you. And uh, uh, there was there was one time when the police tried to close us down. They tried to take our li license off us because in noise under the Noise Pollution Act, I got certain the men in the men in uniform came along with the lawyers and served us with this document to say uh, under the Noise Pollution Act we were being so I had to fight. I, I remember going to the courts licensing court and then I remember like, the power of the people regulars and I, I, it's another strong thing for me about community yeah. whatever community so the community that came in our bar were punks skinheads hippies heavy metal rockers they're all they were the ones that never fitted anywhere else oh I love that right yeah. so they I, and th there was unity in that coming together and, and I remember one of these, God, God rest his soul, he's, he's dead now. He was a saxophone player in the band, a guy called, named Jed Gary. And his words were, we're not going to let this beep happen, right? And he was a, he, he worked in the building trade and as did so many else, he measured up, right? And he says, right, we need so many breeze blocks, so many sheets of plasterboard, so many bits of vent and so and so. And they they worked in, in the evenings, wow. you know, when, and through the night when the bar was shut, and they create they, they bricked up all these windows, put all this ventilation system in uh, for the cost of nothing, yeah. just so that the community still had a place for them to come. That community had a place mm -hmm. for them to come and and to enjoy live music. Brilliant. And then I remember we used to sit and look outside for the. A bloody what do you call it? The environmental health department with their, their meters looking at this. <laughs> <laughs> and he used to, you know, we had some fairly big bands come in and and the systems that were way beyond the size of this place. And he used to literally crap in yourself at night, you know, when these bands were coming. Somebody's going. To... But anyway, we survived. We survived, and 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 we bought another bar eventually mm -hmm. in Jedburgh. So we ended up with two bars and a restaurant, Jedburgh. And uh, we had a good, we, we had good fun. I think that's important to say that. But mm. when you when when you're having, you know, I stopped the merchant navy because I wasn't having fun anymore. And then I stopped, uh, I stopped the bars when I wasn't having any fun. Right. I got to the point where actually, this isn't any fun anymore. It's hard work though. Hospitality is one of those sectors, industries, trades, whatever you want to call it, that is all encompassing. It's not you you take it home. It is your home. Oh, it is your you home. You, you never yeah. I used to say you never go to bed the same That's day it. as you get up. That's <laughs> yeah. But you never you know, you always go to bed the next day, yeah. right? Yeah. You get up in the you get up on the Saturday morning and you go to bed on the Sunday and it and it just rolls on and rolls mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it it is hard, but you know it's it's really, really nice. Yeah. What was it like working with your brother? How was that as a as a family unit doing it together? How did that go? I, do you know, I, I it, it went pretty well. Yeah, it went pretty. I'll, I'll give you why it went pretty well. Yeah. because I remember, I remember uh, uh, when you go into business as a partnership, you'll get advice from whoever to say you should have a partnership agreement. Oops. <laughs> right, so you get a partnership agreement, and you get it drawn up by your lawyer. And and to be honest, it's probably money for old rope for the lawyer. Uh, and just insert this and insert that, charge you whatever they charged you back in the day. Mm. But I never saw that for ten years. Mm. So I just 
we we both signed it and then put it away in the drawer. So so we must have done we must have done okay. You didn't need to see it. You didn't need to yeah. see it. So that mm-hmm. that's a that's a proof. But we had we had fallouts and, and disagreements and, and stuff like that, but ultimately we had uh, a reason to be doing it. Mm-hmm. He 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 had family and I had a wife and, and three kids by that stage. So do you know you need to make it bloody work or else That's it. Yeah, doesn't he doesn't go any far. But it's it's really the what it, that 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 opportunity to hear people and listen to people and engage with people. People open up quite a bit in that. And 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 they have a lot of confidence in 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 you as a yeah. I think see in old school ways, I think pubs had a a real they were a real cornerstone of the community. Yeah, it's a safe place, wasn't it, for a lot of people and do you think it's still like that as much as it used to be? Uh, I, I I don't know. I, yeah. I do the easy the easy answer I think, Sharon, is to say no. Yeah. But I, I couldn't honestly say that because I don't I don't go. Well, this so. is what I, what I was going to get to because I don't really go, and I'm uh-huh. almost thinking maybe back in the day, people did go because that was their safe place. They knew they could go catch up with their mates, no judgment, see a band, all the rest of it. Uh-huh. Do these places exist as much anymore? Maybe they don't. I, no. I, this is genuine. I don't know because uh-huh. I don't go. Uh-huh. But um, I wonder from what you guys had back then. Is there an equivalent now that you partake in as a as a punter, I suppose, um, or is it just not not your scene? Yeah, I, I I I don't I don't have any way that I could hang my hat on now mm-hmm. and say I feel mm-hmm. that's my safe space, that's yeah. my haven, that's where I find kindred spirits, that's where I can uh, open my yeah open myself up yeah, which is. Uh, as a as a man, yeah. As a man, and 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 it, it, it's quite it's quite hard. It's quite hard, you yeah. Know? Men men generally, I find don't uh, they're not as open. No, that's a full three hour discussion on its own. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's one of these where maybe it's just different times. I mean, I remember my granddad would go. He'd go to the pub after his shift on the uh-huh. buses or his shift uh-huh. driving the lorry or whatnot, and that was just the done thing. Uh-huh. And, and my dad, maybe not my dad as much because he was busy working or he was travelling here or doing this. But my now my now partner, so next generation, mm-hmm. um, he's if he's in the pub maybe once every two months, catch up with a couple of his mates. It's not like a thing where it maybe was more of a social piece beforehand. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, I feel like there's not as much of a community in the pub sector as there maybe once was. Um, no, I, if I give you an example, mm-hmm. my wife comes from a village of Ankrum, which is near okay. Jedburgh, okay. if you know that. And it had a village pub, still has a village pub. Uh-huh. And her grandpa, grandpa, who's long dead, Right. Even up until he was 80, 80 odd, mm-hmm. the pub was open on weekday during the daytime, yeah. lunchtime. He 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 would still go there if every day, mm. right? He wasn't drinking or he just he he, he, he might have had a rum, yeah. He, yeah. he might have had a smoke in his pipe, whatever it was, but he was being looked after within yeah. that community. And I, yeah. I think there must still be. So it's probably an answer's on a postcard. Tell us where That's it. tell yeah. us where these are. Where are the best pubs to go and just be yourself and uh-huh. relax and uh-huh. Yeah. But, but uh I it, it was it I got to that point after it was like the Merchant Navy thing, you know, after whatever that was, seven years, and you just mm. got to the point saying uh. nah, that that's enough. And I said to my brother, I says, I'm I'm getting out. Yeah. We'll sell one. Okay. It, you can, he wanted to keep the other. Okay. It was an easy thing to do, so we sold that, split the cash, sorted mm-hmm. the deal out, and off we went. And I'd no, again, yeah. I had no idea what I was going to do. Funny that, isn't it? I had three kids. <sighs> no idea. That's a bit of a, well, it's a leap, but you obviously knew deep down, you'll find something, you'll get something. You just knew this wasn't for you uh-huh. at that point in time. Oh, you got to have trust in your... I know. The trust in yourself. What did you do? What was your... So I started applying for uh, some jobs. Uh-huh. 
And uh, I remember going for one, just to play anything that came up. And uh, I went for one, it's something to do with uh, food wholesaler salesperson. Uh-huh. I remember coming up to Glasgow, outside Glasgow. I'll not say what part in case it gives the game away who they are. <laughs> anyway, and you know, I remember sitting in there and going through this interview process and I actually came out and I said, mm. see if they phone me and say I've got the job. I says, I didn't want it. Oh. I, I couldn't. Yeah. It was uh, it, it was it was like, you know, all hardcore sales and oh, believing in the product <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, not everything. You know, I could see me being uh, given 10 lashes if I didn't sell. Oh. It, it was food products and I'm thinking, my God, I, I, I couldn't do that. Yeah. But, I get, you know, it gave you an insight as to, and I went for another interview similar to that. Mm-hmm. It wasn't in the food side of things. But again, I thought, oh my God, if this is how... If that's how they're trying to entice you in, right? If that's if that's the best it's going to be, oh my God, what's it going to be like when you're actually in there? Yeah. yeah. And, and it's coming to the twenty eighth, twenty ninth, and thirtieth of the month. End of the month. I and know you see your horrible. targets there, and you're only here, and you're thinking, oh no. Yeah. So, so I, I, and then there was a job came up in the in the local paper, and I'd never heard of this organisation before. And and I applied for it, and I really wanted it. I really wanted it, and it was it was an organisation called the Prince's Scottish Youth Business Trust. Oh yeah, yeah. PSYBT, mm-hmm. and it was for a regional manager mm-hmm. for the borders, and it was to help young people start up and continue in business. Nice. Offering them funding, advice, mentoring, that sort of stuff, and I applied. And, and they had this, they said they had to have a uh, computer literacy. I had no I didn't have a computer, I don't think. And uh, you know, you had, I had a computer, but I had to have be knowledgeable of Excel, doing mm. cash flows and all that oh, sort of stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went for the interview and and I'm still I'm still in touch. She's a very good friend of me, uh, mine, the person that interviewed me, and she gave me the job. I wasn't a friend of her at the time, just to just to make that clear. Yeah. <laughs> there was no favouritism there, so I so and I got that job, and it, and it was probably it's probably one of the best things that happened to me. Wow. So so I became regional manager for the Prince's Scottish Youth Business Trust, and I ended up there for so that was nineteen. I think, no, it was uh, year nineteen ninety nine, which was just before the millennium. Uh-huh. And I finished there in 2012, so I was there 12 years. Wow. And I ended up, uh, I did eight years in the borders, and then I took on the role of head of operations for Scotland, mm-hmm. and then ended up director of operations, and then director. So I was 12 years, 12 really, and I still, I, I still uh, speak to people that work there. We just arranged our Christmas party. Nice. Uh, in a few weeks' time for people that weren't there. And I still bump into so many young people who are not so young anymore. Oh, that you helped with so, their so, business. So that the organisation oh. gave a hand up uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, to with funding and connections and advice and support. And some of these are massive businesses now. Brilliant. Really massive businesses, yeah. you know. Yeah. I, I, but that's not a symbol of success, whether they're big or small, you know, big. Big's not beautiful all the time, but the the uh, it, it's the fact that they it changed their that individual's life and gave them an opportunity. Yeah, uh-huh. that's cool. But that's a big step within those twelve years, the progression that you had. So the top th- the the last three roles that you had there was that in quite a short period of time. I mean, what yeah. sort of? So I was, I was regional managing the borders for eight years. For eight, okay. And then I was. Head of operations, then director yep. of operations, then director. Yeah. The chief exec stood down. Yeah. And uh, but it was a, it was in a period where uh, uh, the prince uh, uh, decided that 
he shouldn't have as many charities. Right. So he decided that several of them should merge. Oh, okay. So <laughs> our little charity of about, probably about 40 of us max, maybe 35 to 40 of us, we were to be merged with the uh, Prince's Trust. Ah, okay. Across the whole of the UK. Okay. So uh, that was an experience I'll, I'll never forget. Yeah. That was a year of uh, challenge. Okay. Uh, I, I, and it's broadening the debate around about the word merger gets used. But when somebody so small becomes part of somebody so big, it's very difficult to uh, see a, 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 a parity of opportunity. You know, the, the decisions have been made already as to what shape things are going to look like in the end. And I, I spent quite a bit of time in Glasgow then, and I used to spend quite a few nights just overnight Instead of travelling up and down the borders, uh, eventually I moved to Stirling. But when I was travelling, I remember uh, walking along the quayside to, in, in the town one day. It was about half seven in the morning. I was going to the office, and there was there was a pot of paint lying there, and it, it was a it was one one of the ones you used to get on on a on the ships, we used to buy for painting the side of the ships. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, one of these monster yeah. things that was yeah. metal lid and things like that. And I, I thought to myself, if the big company, the big organisation is that big pot of paint and it's black paint for the side of the ship and this small organisation is about this size, one of these small half a litre mm -hmm. tubs of paint and we are white yeah, and you, you mix it in that's it. That's it. the paint's going to be pretty black yeah yeah. we're not going to have much and I, and I always remember that walking along the river and it was like you know I, I, I it's very difficult to make your voice heard in that situation it's probably one of the toughest years of my life without going you know, it's uh, it, it drove me to uh, pretty much being unwell for a okay. period of time, you know. Uh, but through that difficulty, I think it makes you a stronger. It's all cliche. It sounds sounds very cliched, but sometimes you've got to go through that crap to yeah. to realise what what you have within yourself, mm -hmm. what you have within the people round about you, uh, and what you have within your, your your family, you know. And uh, when I say people round about you, it's the people within work in yeah. that environment. Yeah. But you don't always appreciate the strength that you have until you've, you've gone right down to the bottom. Uh, it's, uh, so that was a year of, a year of, Pretty much torment after after quite a, mm -hmm. a. I think I think it was the. It was probably the. Opposite. It, it, it probably because of the two extremes. Yeah. Because with with with, with PSYBT we were really, on on the crest of a wave, and doing so much good, and and it's not that the next. The, the the next iteration of the organisation was not going to do good for young people. It was that significance of it was the significance of the change, and the way that things happened that impacts on on you personally quite a lot, mm -hmm. and it takes a lot to it takes a lot to work that out in your head. But I had good, as I said, I had good people around about me in the yeah. workplace, and and I would never have survived if it wasn't for my family. So. That's amazing. Hats off to them. I mean, it's it's so true, isn't it, that we're not all great at, at speaking up when we are faced with something that's difficult. Sometimes we can be quite, I know I can hold it in and just get on with it, put a happy face on, crack on, and then eventually, you know, it all comes out because I can't hold anything in for too long. Oh. 
if without having your family, friends around you, obviously you mentioned your work colleagues as well, mm. but and, and you can only talk about however much you want to talk about on, on it, but I think it's an important subject mm. and I'm sure that many people have dealt with it or are dealing with it and obviously will also go through it mm. at some point. Other than just kind of talking about it to those around you, what other things did you do and, and, and maybe what was the point that you thought, you know what, I'm actually not going to put up with this anymore and I'm going to do something different? Um, take that as you will. If, if it's a subject right, you want the, 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 to... The, I mean, it, it, it came to the point where I says, it's a, it's, it's a consistent thread here, but enough is enough, yep. actually. When enough is enough, you, you just stop going, but... Because of because of the nature of that organisation and the people looked out for each other, and when I took that step up to become the director, yeah. and we were going through that, I focused so much on trying to look after everybody else yeah. that in all of that, I, I, you know, I never really looked after myself. Mm -hmm. Until it got to, the, and, and you know, everybody would come at you with what was a, a massive issue for them, and you're trying to fix things and fix things and fix things and juggle f back and forward, and you were the, the go between. Mm -hmm. And remember, you've not just got 30 or 40 in the staff team. We had some like, we had five or 600 volunteers. Jinx, right? of course who all had an opinion on everything. And eventually it, it just, uh, it, it just, it just, it just, you know, yep. took its toll, you know, yep. and uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget uh, when, when, when it all broke down. And thankfully somebody was there to look after me, you know, and uh, Get me away, get me, <laughs> take me home, take and me get home. me to the doctor. You know mm -hmm. that, and which which was what was needed. You know, right. mm -hmm. and, and it's quite hard for a, we go back to that stuff about men. Yeah, you know, and men yeah. men actually accepting that. You know, my God, I'm not very well. You know, yeah. I need help on this sort of stuff. Yeah, and that took me out of the system. That took me. I don't mean, was it about six or eight weeks? I mean, it's not that long in the grand scheme of things, but it's a considerable amount of time oh, when you're in it, you know? It's well, I, I was off. I was, I was out, out of work, for out of the system for six to eight weeks. Yeah. And uh, I don't often speak about that. I don't often, It's just, uh, you know, everybody just sees what they see. But, you know, I think when you, when you have a breakdown like that, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough gig. Mm -hmm. And uh, it shows men don't like to show vulnerability, do they? You know, women are better at that. <laughs> I think so, anyway. Cheers. Maybe I'm being stereotypical. <laughs> I'll be shot on this. No, uh, if my wife watches this, I'll be shot. <laughs> but it's the reality because of the society that we live in, right? It's not a. Uh -huh. It's just because of everyone's perceptions of what uh -huh. a man does and what a woman does doesn't mean to say that that's correct. Uh -huh. um, but. It's an important it's an important one to to talk about because a lot of, a lot of people men included don't talk about it you know it's, it's interesting uh, from a, from a number of perspectives but it, it's that having that lived experience of yeah. having had a, a breakdown like that yeah and actually then being in you know I, I went on to young enterprise Scotland mm -hmm. after that mm -hmm. And then I've, I've, you know, uh, you've got a similar number of staff, similar number of your team, 30 folk, but you're also engaging with uh, other like-minded and similar positioned individuals on a regular basis. Uh, but it gives you a sense of, uh, it gives you a, 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 a perception, or it gives you an insight, it actually, I, I could be speaking to somebody and thinking, my God, he's he's on the cusp of something here, you know. I mean, I'm not saying I'm a predictor of gloom and doom, yeah. but do you know that? It's an awareness thing. An awareness yeah. of, of, of somebody who's having a difficult time and actually 
needs a cup of coffee mm -hmm. and needs an arm around the shoulder in a, in a conversation. Yeah. Uh, so, so anyway, I, 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 I did zap after that. I, yeah. I, 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 I jacked the Prince's <laughs> Trust uh, in July 2013, I think I left. Right. July 2013. Right. Gosh. That was my fond farewell. Well, you know, you stuck it out for a decent amount of time. Well, I lasted the Prince's Trust 12 months in total yeah. since they went from the merger. Yeah. Uh, but I did 12 years of wonderful years with PSYVT. Mm -hmm. I remember as I was exiting, I spent my sitting at home. Uh, and we'd moved to Stirling by this mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And I knew there was a a massive gap in entrepreneurship support within the colleges sector. Nice. Okay. Just from my own mm -hmm. knowledge and experience. And uh, I, I decided to create a programme for that. And... I've got to remember writing, uh, registering domain names and Twitter handles mm -hmm. and all sorts of stuff, and writing the program for that it was going to be called, and uh, it was called Bridge to Business. Nice. And I could have gone and set up a new. I, I considered setting up a new charity to do it and all that sort of stuff, and I. I, had, I stuck to my guns because I've always said I, 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 I believe there's too many charities competing for too much, too little money, and instead of focusing on the issue that mm -hmm. they're trying to solve, and then he's to, anyway. So I, I, I had this package of bridge to business ready, and that instead of setting up something new, I wanted to find out a home for it within a, a sort of an organisation that would make a good space for it. Mm -hmm. And I ended up with Young Enterprise Scotland. Oh, so yeah. that's so they took it on. I think they were keen to get the, get the money that the government had said they would give me. Because <laughs> the Scottish government said they would give me money for a pilot year. Nice. So, uh, so off I went to Young Enterprise Scotland in August or September of that year, 2013. Mm -hmm. And the Bridge to Business programme was born in City of Glasgow College. Great. And now, 10 years on, it still happens in most colleges across Scotland. That's ace. Oh, yes. God. So, so that's a good one. So interestingly that they took on your idea. Obviously, you had a bit of funding behind you, fine. What do you think it was about the programme that made Young Enterprise Scotland go, all right, We'll take that. Yeah, we'll give them a chance. We'll give it a go. Uh, I, I think there's an element of the cash, if I'm being brutally honest. <laughs> okay. right? uh, but let's just be realistic. Let's here. be realistic. And it was a good time of year. Their, yeah. their year end was the 31st of August or whatever it was. And it would be a nice nice yeah. little bundle to roll in. But I think from the, the, the that, that that could seem quite cynical, but the, the from a, a director's perspective, from, from those that were overseeing that opportunity, I think they would see something that gave them a new route to market, yep. an increase. Yep. It wasn't doing something that was different. It was just they were very well known for their work in primary and secondary schools. Mm -hmm. And naturally, the environment that they weren't in that was connected to it, that was, mm. was tertiary education. But mostly, you know, the college sector. And, and I suppose at that time, and as is now, there's, there's more crossover between secondary and, 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 and college and, and further education. Yeah, okay. So you'll have, you'll have young people uh, who maybe complete part of their schooling in, in schools and mm -hmm. part of their schooling in colleges. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and it just seemed to make, it seemed to make common sense. And there was also other programmes that, Young Enterprise Scotland had that could be plugged in assets, resources. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't it wasn't like saying, you know, we, we need to create a whole new governance structure, we need a, need a new IT system, we need this, that and everything. 
basically it was just great. It was just another person and and yeah. and, and setting it up. So yeah, I so I, I, and I I was there for a year setting that up, and then the chief exec of Young Enterprise stepped down, mm -hmm. and I took on. They asked me to take on the role of chief exec a year later. So that was in two thousand and. I think that was been 2014, I think, mm -hmm. ish. And I was there until last August as chief executive. Jeez, so that's ace. That, that was a good time. Yeah, and you, you enjoyed time. enjoyed it. How how did that compare to your obviously Hello, you know my, yeah. my previous chapters? Uh, uh, that uh, that was tough. Yeah. Uh, it 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 was in a. I don't think I'd be giving anything away. It was in a because. All of the information's in the public domain, so you can go into a company's house and have a look. But if uh, you looked at uh, the fragility of the organisation in 2014, we were hanging on by a, 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 a whisker. I was going to say something more rude, but we are hanging on just... And... If it wasn't for the chair, we appoint they appoint the new chair and myself. And uh, this is her words, not mine. She she's very much she was very much a street fighter. Okay. And I was a get shit done mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, uh, many might have looked at it and said. Uh, it's not very strategic, but it wasn't about strategic at that point. It was about survival. Yeah. Uh, but gradually, as we, uh, uh, I remember, I remember creating a spread. Well, uh, I'm not very good with spreadsheets, but my most trusted person in the organisation, who's still there, she, she created a spreadsheet, and literally mm -hmm. we used to look at that every morning to see what we're paying and what we're not okay. paying. Okay. I'd love to see that spreadsheet now. Go back about 11 years, but wow. I'd love to go back and look at... That'd be interesting, I yeah. I would love to go back. Yeah. And, uh, but basically, we and, and I think we were speaking offline before about, you know, tough calls and making yeah. people redundant. Yeah. And that, that was, that was a hard time, that very... Yeah. You know, you've just been asked to take this on and... You've been working alongside these other people on a on a par, mm -hmm. just as one of the team, mm -hmm. uh, and you get asked to take on the chief exec's role in July, and by September and October, uh, you have to have conversations with people about there's not a there's not a role here. It's really tough. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that that. that but you know, sometimes you've got to cut things back to mm -hmm. start again. Mm -hmm. And uh, ten years on, they have a huge presence, mm -hmm. big team, relationships with the Scottish government, mm -hmm. relationships with people internationally. They've taken students abroad. Oh, yeah. uh, they have digital presence. So, so it was a good. It's something I'm pro if, if if there's many things I'm proud of, but that that nine or ten years were just uh, uh, was great, and and the people that stuck had a good recruited a good board of trustees, mm -hmm. and and but more they they were great, but the people that stuck with us and grew as a team, I ended up hardly doing it. it it ran itself, the, yeah. the, the, the autonomy within the organisation, the creativity, mm -hmm. very values based, and they just got on and did stuff, mm -hmm. right? And they were, uh, they were always trying to do something new and always innovating. And and uh, I, I'll look back at that nine or ten years. I think it was there ten years, but I think it was nine years, I'm not very really sure. Yeah, yeah. I look back on that as... Uh, as one of the proudest things in my work in life, doing that. That's so. really cool. Um, but you mentioned something there about the team, how they were all 
very autonomous, super creative, innovative, you could trust them, all the rest of it. Do you think that that's in the team member or do you think that comes from the leadership? How, how do we get the teams to be more like that? Are they just like that as people and that's why we've hired them? Or is there stuff we can do as leaders to help get more out of your team in that way? Uh, I, I, as leaders, we have a responsibility to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know, I, I, it's a responsibility. The enemy that doesn't do that, they, 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 they shouldn't be there. They, they honestly shouldn't be there. And the, the answer to a problem the best thing to do with anything lies in the hands of the person that's closest to that, right? And and you you uh, you know, uh, assume permission and expect forgiveness. Yeah. Let let people do what they need to do. Now, there will always be an occasion where actually the chief exec or the director or whoever it is the person responsible is going to say, stop it there, Harry. I'm, I'm going to have to say that's, yeah. we're, we're pausing that just now because actually it, it's just not the right thing or whatever it might be. There's, and, and there's, way, there's right ways to do that. But you, you, you need to give people the, the freedom to, you need to give them the freedom to fail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have to have the freedom to fail because if they don't, if they don't, if they don't fall off the bike, right? Then, then actually, do you know, the, they don't realise how sore it is when you fall off the bike, and yeah. and then encourage them to get back on and and and, and try it again. Yeah. It's all the cliches under the sun, but it's so <laughs> it's so true. But the point you asked earlier about that, you know, is it is it leadership? And yes, it is leadership responsibility. But there there is an element of who you recruit in to the to the roles in the in the first instance. And uh, we we got rid of anything to do with uh, deg degrees are wonderful things, right? But the 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 it it wasn't a, it wasn't a an important factor in our hiring. Uh, the other important factor for us was uh, diversity in in recruitment, uh, 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 particularly in age uh, and experience and you know we we had all of that and the way that we interviewed was we well, really had we, we used four questions we had four core values and the questions were all about you know attitudes and experiential uh, uh, experiences that those people had, people had had around about those values, yeah. and they might not have known it, but if they'd done their homework and they saw our our values were, you know, were, were key to us, and uh, that that was the, the so so yes, there is an element of 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 getting the people right in the first instance, but you'll never get it always right. That's, That's it. I, I don't think anyway. Mm -hmm. I don't think you'll ever get it always right, and I think that the, the just before, just before I finished, was a uh, we got investors in People Platinum. Okay. And uh, that, that that was our that was one of my happiest days getting mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I was, I, I'll be honest. I was never a huge fan of investors in people, mm -hmm. and I would have chucked it out the door <laughs> uh, when I first came in. Because I saw this report and I was more red on it Ooh. and I actually thought, you know, I can't be asked with this. Yeah. What value is it going to be? And I listened to the person who was closest to it, who's still there, and she says, We've got to we've got to fight to keep that and use that as a use that as a gauge to see yeah. how we're doing. Yeah, okay. And we did, and we ended up brilliant. IIP platinum. Brilliant. I also never nearly threw out the SQA <laughs> centre status as well because I saw a report that had red all over it. We're just ingrained to having seen the red on reports or tests or anything. It just it's PTSD. I, I, I you just know? said, oh, I should get, get rid of that. And, yeah. and 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 the other person, I I asked, I asked a few people, and they said, Jeff, don't chuck that out. Yeah. It's just 
you'll never get it back, repair it and work hard. So we did. Brilliant. So uh, God, so a great number of years there. And then that ended, did you yeah. say just last year? August, la July, July, end of July last year, 2022, right. I finished. So you've had a year uh -huh. of not being an employee, technically. Yeah. Uh, How's that been? Marvellous. Yeah. <laughs> the first the first few months were, were, were pretty, pretty difficult, if mm -hmm. I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. uh, because you, you become... As, as as much as much as you give autonomy to the team, there, there's people still looking for a wee nod of thanks or an approval or right, just we nudge here and we nudge there. So when you had thirty people running around you and all these volunteers, you were quite a busy person, yeah. always doing that in demand. It, mm -hmm. Aye, mm -hmm. and and then for that moving into. <laughs> doing stuff yourself uh, it, it become quite different different uh, I think once the turn of the year came you know whether it was a psychological thing and a new calendar year new year actually I felt more positive about that and I also started I, I, I've got a contract now I'm working with the STV Children's Appeal as nice. part of it Nice. So looking after their grant assessment, so I, I find the, the charities to support and then work with them. So I do a small amount of work for them. And then I, I've been really blessed in working with the uh, with the Hunter Foundation on a project uh, that they're funding with BBC Children in Need. Nice. Uh, which is called What Matters to You. Okay. And it, I, I think it, we've used the word community quite a bit. Uh, and this is all about community uh, and it's all about listening to the voice of people in communities, particularly communities where they're never given any time, they're never giving any respect, where services are pushed down to them and actually working with them to actually learn from them what they would like to see happen in a community and helping them to be able to achieve that. Mm -hmm. And then coming back in over the top and working with the chief exec of the council and the senior leadership of the council mm -hmm. and actually uh, encouraging systemic change in the way that they work mm -hmm. and changing the, the way that they invest in services and putting more into frontline preventative, autonomising spend within that community to the local leaders that understand where that money needs mm -hmm. to be spent. And actually bringing out the, the qualities that are in people within these communities. Uh, we took 12, I don't know if you know Dundee very well, Charleston, yeah. Yeah, you know yeah. Charleston, mm -hmm. part of the Strathmartin, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, part of the Lockheed Ward. We took 12 women from there that we've been working with to uh, a place called, I think it's Ducali. Some people call it Duckley. It's near Glen Eagles anyway. It's not, yep. the, it's not the big Glen Eagles. It's a mini, mini version. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we took them there uh, and, and it's probably one of the most inspiring experiences of my life to see these women on a values-based leadership experience mm -hmm. coming out themselves. And, and it's about releasing the strengths within them. I'm sounding quite biblical and it. it's, not, it's not biblical I mean, in any way. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's about releasing that stuff and some of the stuff they're going to do in that community. And uh, if you take a step into Charleston and you see the worlds within which these women are living, uh, it, 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 it it's change of the highest magnitude, wow. and I get quite I get quite emotional when I see all that happening. Mm -hmm. It's it's a, I think we should have sponsored that last experience at Ducali with Kleenex, but you know what I mean. It was just it's so such a, and I was back there last Friday, week past Friday, mm -hmm. uh, and to see the change and the improvement wow. and the positivity. Uh, in terms of these women looking to take things into control for their own hands. Mm -hmm. Now our, now our job is to work with them and support them, but we're also working with practitioners. So okay. people from health, people from community learning and development, people oh, from yeah. housing, the local primary school head teacher, and enabling them to have a different mindset and doing stuff mm -hmm. differently. And the real secret sauce will be when we get all of these practitioners yeah. and parents in the same room. Yes. 
it's it's so 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 it's, it it comes back to, uh, and I think actually it, that takes it right back to community, but it mm -hmm. takes it right back to nineteen seventy seven. There you go. Nineteen seventy seven and DIY there doing you know. it yourself and yeah. realizing that actually get up off your backside, but some people need a wee bit help to get Absolutely. off their backside mm -hmm. and actually encouragement and support and uh, the more of that that we can do. Uh, the, the, the better it will be for for everybody, you know. And, you know, thank God there's people like you that are there to help orchestrate all that support because, you know, it's it's not easily accessible, I don't think, for a lot of people, so... It's, it's not, but thank God those women are there. That's right. Do you know what I mean? That's so right. it, 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 that, Works both ways. It, 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 yeah. Do you know, actually, I, I, I'd be... I'd be diddly squat up yeah. there in, in <laughs> Dundee if... Uh, and, and I don't come for Dundee, yeah. right? And I'm also we're also starting this work in Clark Manager now as well. And you're thinking, I, I, they're, they're never, it needs to be somebody local, yeah. right? And, and mm -hmm. we've got a wonderful woman in Charleston, right? Mm -hmm. Her name's Elspeth, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and she, the, the the community have that confidence. Yes, that's what they need. And they have the trust in her. Yeah. And the only the, if it wasn't for her, I, and and this, you could say it's sad. Uh, you could say. Who cares? But the reason we got those 18 families together and 12 women went away is we, we put stuff on for them in the community. Mm -hmm. And if the hook was the fact that food was the hook and they're able to feed their kids and have a bit of chill time without mm -hmm. worrying about how they're going to do things on a Monday night, if that's what ha takes to make that happen, then you know, that's all forgotten about now. Mm -hmm. Now they're... They'll be they'll be marching on the city hall in Dundee yeah. in, in a few days' time, demanding demanding more, yeah. and that's just yeah. great stuff, you know. It's so beautiful. It's beautiful to see. I love that. So good. What a man of many colours, and I love it how we've kind of come round in a circle right back to 1977. 1977, again. and my radio show is called Evolution 77. <laughs> You there you go, because everything started Plug. in 77. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Jeff, listen, thank you so much. What a great chat. So many good bits. So Superb. Thank you Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, Sean. Of okay. course. Okay. Of course. See you soon. All good. Bye. Bye.